All right, guys, we're back with part two here of this video, um, talking about medical legal issues. Again, we're going to have some more in-class time on this, uh, but the, again, it's very important that you understand these uh, the paramedic relationships. Make sure you understand what the laws that govern and the things that can get you in trouble. Uh, confidentiality. Uh, yeah, what happens in the back of the truck stays with us in the back of the truck. We don't release this unless we have a, uh, a release from the patient that says it's okay or their legal guardian, okay? Um, it's very important. Uh, what happens there stays there. We don't go sharing it with other people. Uh, again, make sure that the, the patient has to consent to the release of their records. Um, and matter of fact, the law is very specific on this, and that's that, that would be the HIPAA laws in which, again, uh, um, the other people that might need to know this very specifically spelled out in HIPAA. Um, and again, uh, third-party billing requirements, again, usually we have them sign a release with that. That's usually the thing that you get them to sign about the billing. Now, this is the guy, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, okay? Long and short, uh, this is what we used to call medical ethics. They made it into a law. Uh, it changes in which the, you get the, you file for insurance and Medicare. It adds layers of pr protection of privacy for the patient. And again, it, in their regards to their health care, and we can defame them. Okay, we can uh, make false communications that injures a person and their reputation or good name. You can be held liable for that. By the way, liable. Speaking of liable, that is a uh, act of injuring a person's character, name, or reputation by false statements in writing. Okay, uh, I, I share the famous clip from Star Spider Man Slander is spoken, and that would be the slander right here in which he makes spoken statements. Libel is in print, right? So, slander, slander is spoken in print, it's libel. Okay, um, and I would probably remember both of those because you're probably going to see those later. Uh, when you release confidential information without justification uh, regarding the patient's private life or exposes them to ridicule, notoriety, or embarrassment. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just evaded their privacy, and yes, you can be sued. Uh, the best thing I can tell you guys, don't talk to anybody about your patient. What happens back there stays back there. Have a nice day. Don't do it. And again, if, especially like if you're transporting a celebrity or, or a, a person of prominence in the community, oh yeah, you're going to get asked. The best thing to do is say, yep, I am uh, uh, went to the hospital. There you go. Or matter of fact, that can be even construed as as giving away their privacy. You can just say, I can't talk about it. And that's that's the end of it. OK, uh, consent is granting permission to treat. And again, by law, you have to have the patient's consent before you do it. We usually do this via informed consent. We're going to tell them what's going to happen, the nature of the risk, the recommended treatments, uh, all the benefits, all the dangers, any alternative treatments that we can do and the dangers of refusing uh, treatment and or transport. Express consent, this is most common. People, usually when they call 911, we kind of assume it's express consent, but it's always good to have that informed consent. That's what we really want. But uh, again, verbally to treat, again, that's verbally, non-verbally, and in writing. And implied consent means that the patient requires emergency intervention, but is mentally, physically, or emotionally unable to grant consent. If the person's on drugs, are they able to consent to treatment? If it affects their ability. And this is one that kind of gets people in a little bit of a uh, legal gray area, I guess is what you could say. Is uh, let's, say, let's say someone is intoxicated on alcohol. They are able to give you their name, rank, social security number, what they do, what their birthday it is. But are they able to make an informed decision? And that is the criteria that they usually go off of. Involuntary consent is when you have a court order or the patient, whether the patient can go, whether they want to or not. Uh, this can also be implemented by uh, police officers and or doctors via um, a Marchman Act or, or Baker Act. Um, and again, they have to go there. It's an involuntary consent situation. So a competent adult in police custody does not lose the right to make medical decisions for themselves. Ooh, I can't say that one enough. So yes, they have the right to say no. Even though the officer says, do it, doesn't matter. Okay, now they can say they're going to go to the hospital, but the, the, they can then say, well, weird, I don't consent to treatment. So at that point, again, it's kind of a mute point. 
So your consent, uh, again, for a minor, it has to be a parent, legal guardian, or court-appointed custodian. Um, this can be, in certain cases, uh, an older sibling that's a, of an adult age. Um, an emancipated minor, by the way, is considered an adult. This is the person that's under the age of legal consent, uh, usually under the age of 18, that it makes a, that the court has said that they are considered to be able to make their own decisions. Uh, a competent adult may con withdraw consent from any treatment at any time. And uh, by the way, you must be able to inform them of, uh, of when they are refusing. Okay, so you have to be able to document it. By the way, if you kind of already got the hint on this one, uh, if you're getting a refusal or a refusal of care, uh, they're not giving consent. That's usually a really long report, okay? Because you got a you got a chart that you did all these things that they understood what you told them, and that they still disagreed and did not want to do it. So all those things have to be effectively charted. And by the way, um, this right here I think is probably a really horrible um, a refusal, but it is an example of one. Um, they're probably going to get tore up by any lawyer with any halfway decent went to a law school. Um, so, and then, again, can you still be held negligent for getting a refusal? I think that answer is yes. Uh, but, again, if you have that documentation and good documentation, you have a much better ability to defend yourself. Uh, again, uh, if you get a refusal of service, the patient, uh, they... they they have to be able to legally permitted to refuse care. They must be a competent adult. They must make multiple and sincere attempts to convince the patient to go to the hospital. Enlist the help of family, friends who'd be surprised how it worked. Um, supervisors, doctors, make sure that you do that, okay? Consult with online medical direction. Have the doc talk to the patient, okay? The more the merrier in this situation. Make certain that the patient is fully informed of the, of the risk of refusing and make sure that I always chart that they understood that or give an example where they understood it. And then have the patient and a disinterested witness, somebody who is a third party to this or, or, or a family member, have them sign the release of liability that they witnessed that this person understood these things and still wanted to do it. And again, uh, uh, one of the other things I always chart is, is you can call 911 if you decide to change your mind. Hey, we're here. We'll come back and get you. Uh, attend the family or friends to stay with the patient, and you need to make sure that you document thoroughly. I'm going to say that again. Document thoroughly. Document, document, document. All right? You got a violent patient, victim of a drug overdose, uh, intoxicated or ill or injured minors with no adult available. Yeah, that kind of gets sticky from time to time. Uh, attempt to develop a trust and rapport. Uh, refusal should be completed and witnessed by the police officer. In case of, especially if they uh, that they are altered or if they fall into that category, they're in a, a drug overdose. Uh, this really gets sticky. Are they able to make an informed decision? If they're not, then we can transport these folks under implied consent. Uh, conversation with the patient refusal witnesses by a disinterested third party always keeps us out of trouble. Well, not always, but for the most part, will keep us out of trouble. Because it shows the intent that we tried to transport this patient, and at that point, this patient decided, no, we're not going to go. Uh, boundaries, uh, ethical and societal limits to interact between paramedics and healthcare professionals. So crossing professional boundaries can result in breaching your responsibility. Okay, so be careful when you do that. Uh, some danger zones, by the way, and unfortunately, we're falling more and more into this, especially when we're talking about the amount of work that we're having to do, being tired, fatigued, leads to bad decision-making, leads to vehicle crashes. State of Maryland, by the way, actually put out a, uh, the, their medical director said that if you're attending patients, you can't more than, we work more than 14 hours. Uh, they, they, matter of fact, it says that they have to work no more than 12, but 14 is their legal law where you can't work any more than that. Um, made a whole lot of people mad up there a whole lot of people but guess what it's probably better for the patients uh being seduced and led away from one's principles that figured their allegiance uh you want to stay away from them and being unprepared Ooh, yeah that one we do have control over okay um abandonment 
you leave the patient there, you terminate the relationship when they still need care, and you willfully and knowingly do so. Uh, that is a no-no, and again, you can be charged with abandoning a patient. There are both criminal and civil penalties for that. Uh, you unlawfully person uh, uh, cause bodily harm without their consent, uh, or you actually touch them in another manner. That uh, just threatening them as assault. If you actually touch them, that is when it becomes battery. Yes, that is a legal legal terminology in which you can be held criminally liable for that. Okay, uh, false imprisonment. Uh, you intentionally and unjustifiably detain somebody without their consent or legal authority. In other words, you have a awake alert person who knows what's going on, able to make an informed decision, and you decide to throw them in the back of the truck and kidnap them and take them to the hospital. Congratulations, that's called false imprisonment. Good luck on that because you're probably going to get in trouble. Now, you're, now the, the counter to that is, is, well, they weren't able to make an informed decision. Uh, be ready to defend those actions with a really good run report when you do that. Reasonable force. Ooh, boy. We could go major into this one. Guys, uh, we don't want to hurt people. But there's some times that we have to restrain people to protect them so that they don't hurt themselves or you or others. And if you use excessive force, uh, you can be held liable. More importantly, back to that one picture that we showed uh, where they were trying to restrain somebody and hold them. Again, if that gets into the wrong, it, again, somebody takes a video of that and it gets put on nightly news. And you are using excessive force in which to subdue the patient. You're asking for trouble, okay? Am I going to say that it's happened in the past? I think that it has. Um, and again... You just have to be careful in this day and time. Again, pretend like the camera is always on you. You don't want to use excessive force. Use just as much as you need. Chemical restraints are an excellent choice versus physical restraints of the patient. And again, force used as punishment is considered assault and battery. So yes, if you hit them with the sandbag because they reached up and bit you, unfortunately, yeah, that's unreasonable force. Can't do that. Um, use of restraints can be used for a combative patient. Again, use your local protocol. Make sure that you use just enough restraint to hold them down, but not enough restraint to hurt them in any way, shape, form, fashion. So again, by the way, we're going to teach you this in defensive tactics. That's the reason we kind of teach you guys defensive tactics is because we want to make sure that you do it correctly. Okay. By the way, notice how they're cross-arming this. There's some people that put arms up and down. Remember, if you put arms up, that's kind of like crucifying somebody. They have difficulty breathing. So, again, proper position make is important. Uh, again, your patient transport, maintain the same level of care as if it was initiated on scene. Uh, be familiar with your state and local laws about using the ambulance, when to use lights and sirens. Taking somebody code 3 to the hospital, lights and sirens on, if they have a non-emergent situation, and you hit somebody in the route. Yes, you can be found liable for that if another paramedic would not have transported that in an emergency situation. Uh, facility selection needs to be based upon, yes, the patient gets to make the request, the patient's need, and the facility's capacity. I want to stress that one major here. Um, I've had patients that were, let's say, a trauma alert. They didn't want to go to facility X. They wanted to go to facility Y. Facility Y does not have a trauma center. Facility X does. Again, you explain to the patient that they can't care for you at Facility Y, but they don't care. They want to go to Facility. Um, they want to go to Facility Y because they can't. They they don't want to go to Facility X. Yes, you have to take them there. Okay. Now there's some things that you can do in the process. You can actually call up on the radio and go, Hey, uh, Doc, you want to talk to this person because you need to tell them. Hey, we can't handle you here. Hey, we can transfer you. But again, you need to make sure that they understand the reason why. If they can't understand the reason why, implied consent, we can do that. But you should not, and I repeat, should not. You should take them where they want to go. Make your life easier, ladies and gentlemen. Spend the five to ten extra minutes. Take them where they want to go. 
people that go where they want to go don't sue you. Okay, I'm going to say that again. They don't sue you. So some resuscitation issues in the state of Florida. We actually have a yellow piece of paper that says, State of Florida Department of Health, do not resuscitate order. It's obvious. Uh, again, in, in, in resuscitation, by the way, we don't work corpses. Uh, it seems too hazardous to enter. We don't work those folks, okay? Um, now, there's people that have advanced directives, living wills, durable power of attorneys. Um, there is a difference between those guys. Living wills usually say if my attending physician determines. We The good news is we're not attending physicians, so we really don't fall under that document. The only one that we do fall under is the do not resuscitate. Uh, the other thing is, is they do have an organ donor card. We might actually work that patient and take them to the hospital so that they can be harvested. So these are things to think about with your advanced directives, okay? Um, living wills are usually more for the hospital where the DNR is an actual legal binding document, okay? And a valid DNR should be honored as your protocols allow. Here's the one little catch to the old DNR here. Guys, um, unfortunately, the person's health care surrogate or power of attorney does have the right to reset that. It gets a little hairy when you do that. All right. Um, and unfortunately, it, it usually requires you to explain to the family member, this is the dying process. Uh, and I've actually had patients, uh, family members go, I know what it says. I don't care, save them. And at that point, you're really in between a rock and a hard place. And when in doubt, I would say work them. Because again, can we stop the resuscitation once we get to the hospital and and doctors intervene with that? Yes, they can. Okay. So be aware of that, uh, that they can do that. The physician order for life-sustaining treatment, uh, this is usually done for terminally ill patients. And uh, uh, this is actually usually, uh, there's other states that have this. I don't think that we do that. Um, but again, terminally ill patients, uh, the, the physician consults on the patient wishes, incorporates them. Um, so this is kind of where they guide their care. Okay. Um, I want to also want a little stress stressor here with the do not resuscitate. Do not resuscitate does not mean do not treat. Okay. And what I mean by that is, is if you can provide comfort measures for that patient where you can ease their breathing while not artificially continuing their life. Please do so. Um, don't take the DNR as do not treat. All right. So make sure that you understand that there is the difference between those two. Again, if they're an organ donator, remember that organs are in short supply. And if they do have that, uh, consult your mom line medical direction. Uh, I would highly recommend if you're going to do an organ donation that you go where they can actually do a harvest. Uh, Shans is probably your best bet on that. Um, death in the field. Uh, both uh, be appropriate dealt uh, through the thoroughly documented. Uh, there sh it should meet very specific criteria. This one's kind of changed a little bit. Um, we actually have protocols now where we're working two rounds in the field. There's no response. They meet certain criteria. The end title's below 10. The patient's in asystole. We have a confirmed airway. And uh, the, the patient's had uh, two rounds of medication, has been worked for 20 minutes. They're actually saying you can stop these in the field. Don't take them to the hospital. And I'm a big, actually a huge advocate of that. Okay. So you can do these things. Um, again, check your local protocols on that. Crime and accident scenes. Uh, if you think that there's a crime that has been committed because of the scene and law enforcement's not already involved, yes, you have an obligation to notify them. Uh, protect yourself. Make sure that you are safe. And once the crime scene is determined safe, you can initiate your patient contact and your medical care. If it's safe to take the patient with you, take the patient with you. If the, the threat is imminent and you can't save the patient, you save your crew. You save yourself. Okay? Uh, do not move or touch anything at the crime scene. Do your best to protect the evidence so that the, the lawyers and the police officers can put the bad guys where they don't ever do this again. And if you need to remove, make sure that you let the officers know what you did, and how you did it, okay? Uh, you should treat scenes of accidents in the same way, by the way. Uh, again, treat patients as medically indicated, but you're, you're, use the resources you got, make sure your crew is safe, and call for help when you need it. So, guys, we talked about this a little bit earlier. 
uh, abuse, neglect. We want to re we, we want to report these. We're legally obligated to report them. Okay. So in the state of Florida, I can tell you that you are definitely obligated to report uh, any type of abuse or neglect cases. Uh, uh, 1-800-96-ABUSE is kind of the clearinghouse number for that. And again, they they send investigators, gang. They, they're actually really good about it. Uh, we should not confront abusers, by the way. Uh, that usually ends bad. Uh, document, proof, just the facts. You don't. It's not your job to prove to prove abuse or neglect. It's your job to report it. We will send somebody out there to make sure that, that they get investigated. Okay. Um, document, document, document. It's got to be thorough. It's got to be objective. It's got to be accurate. It has to maintain the patient's confidentiality. Okay. Got to be thorough, objective. Notice that statement, objective. Keep your subjective statements out of it, okay? Just the facts, all right? It should be no spelling errors in it. The grammar should be decent in it. Should not use a lot of acronyms or only approved acronyms through your service, okay? And remember that it is the medical record for a period of time as prescribed by state law, okay? So again, by the way, the electronic chart, the same way. It, it is part of the, it, when you're charting these things, that is part of the medical record. It just kind of makes our job a little bit easier as far as data collection. Um, employment laws. Uh, you need to address employee-employer relationships. Uh, some of these things are actually governed by, by contract. Uh, union contract can also come into play. And by the way, volunteer agencies, they also fall under the jurisdiction of many of these laws. Uh, they can be very complex, and I would highly recommend for your employment purposes that you would consult an employment attorney or, or a specific attorney with that. Um, I've had to use a, several of them uh, through the course of my career, and I can tell you that, yes, they can be. Uh, one of the cool things, as an employer, you learn kind of the things not to do, but you more importantly learn when they show up saying certain things that, that it's probably best to avoid that situation altogether. The flip of that is, is you don't tell the employee about it. So what the employee has to do is go to a lawyer and the lawyer goes, well, did you ask blah, blah, blah? And you say, no, you walk in the door and you go, Hey, what about blah, blah, blah? And they go, and they go, Oh, you know about that? Well, you know, we can work this out. Uh, it, it's kind of actually rather amazing. Uh, American with Disability Acts, you cannot, uh, you prohibits discriminating against qualified individuals. If you guys want to talk to me about that one, I, I actually have some really good um, uh, working with that. Being a diabetic um, and, and when I was coming up through the fire service, uh, you know, they tried to say that you couldn't do it. It was the American with Disabilities Acts that actually allowed me to become a firefighter. Uh, Title VII, by the way, it pre prevents uh, workplace discrimination. And again, Title VII is, is kind of a culmination of several acts with that, with their amendments. Um, and then the Family Medical Leave Act, uh, that allows you to get off time duty in order to spend time with your children. Uh, the Fair Labor Standards Act is the minimum wage, overtime, record keeping. And yes, certain EMS agencies fall under a different category under this one. And Occupational Safety and Health Administration has multiple regulations that cover the safety. Ryan White Care Act, by the way, it allows you to, for health care victims uh, of AIDS in their family so that you can get testing as needed. This allows us to do that. So in the matter of about 50 minutes, we've covered a lot of law. And, and obviously, we're going to do a lot more in the classroom. Law... It, it, my best statement for you, be nice, do what's in the best interest of the patient, don't beat somebody up, be nice, and do what you think is right. Most of the time, that's going to keep you out of trouble, okay? And then document, 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 document. I can't stress that enough. That's the best ways that I can tell you to avoid problems with the legal process. All right. Enough of that. We're going to talk about it more in class, and I will see you guys on the next one.